Scientists recently used lasers to cool anti-hydrogen down to extremely cold temperatures, down to a temperature of around 50 millikelvin. That is 0.05 degrees above absolute zero. It is quite difficult to make anything that cold, let alone antimatter that wants to annihilate with any matter that it encounters. So how did these scientists use lasers to cool these anti-hydrogen atoms down? How do they even make anti-hydrogen atoms? And why do we care? Let's discuss it. To start with, what is antimatter? Antimatter is a different form of the regular matter that we observe in the universe, but it is opposite in some ways. Matter consists of quarks and leptons, where there are six quarks, the up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom, three leptons, electrons, muons, and taons, and three lepton neutrinos. These particles make up everything around us, and they interact through a different set of force-carrying particles, gluons, photons, Z bosons, W bosons, and the Higgs. Antimatter is particles that mirror the quality of regular matter, but have the opposite charge, as well as a few other quantum numbers. We can make antimatter by just producing enough energy, but in doing so, we always make the same matter version of this particle. So to make an anti-top quark, we also make a top quark. This way, the number of baryons, or matter versus antimatter particles, that exist in the universe is the same. But this brings up one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. If the number of antimatter particles versus matter particles must be constant, and it appears like they always come in pairs, then where is all the antimatter? There are many theories, but to either rule them out or to confirm them, we need to know more about antimatter in general. Thus, we need to make antimatter, store it so it is safe, and experiment like crazy. Antimatter is often made in particle accelerators. It is a standard byproduct of smashing things together at high velocities. Scientists have known about this for a long time. In fact, the first direct measurement of a positron or an anti-electron was made around 1930 by several different groups, but eventually Carl David Anderson won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1936 for this discovery. This discovery was noticing that particles in a cloud chamber, which is just a particle detector, were for some reason moving in the opposite way in magnetic fields than normal electrons. Thus, an electron with an opposite charge, the positron. Later on, in the 1950s, the first antiproton was discovered by two scientists, Emilio Sergei and Owen Chamberlain, for which they won the 1959 Nobel Prize in Physics. And finally, in 1995, the CERN collaboration showed that they were able to combine these two antimatter particles to make anti-hydrogen. At the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, scientists can regularly make antimatter. They do this by colliding high-velocity particles, either with other similarly high-velocity particles, or with barriers, which makes a shower of particles. The antiprotons, or the regular protons that are inside these showers, can then be sorted by passing the particles through a magnetic field as they bend in opposite directions. Then, the antiprotons are slowed down by using electric fields in the opposite fashion to the way that the particles are accelerated, that is, by changing the direction of the field to apply a force to slow the particle down rather than speed it up. Finally, the antiprotons are stored in a potential field. Using a combination of electric and magnetic fields, they can levitate the antimatter particles in space so they cannot encounter regular matter particles. By controlling these potentials, the antiproton and the positron from another source can then be combined to make antihydrogen. Now the antihydrogen is already somewhat cold, 
because it has been slowed right down and captured. But to perform detailed measurements, we need it to be colder still. Getting atoms to be very cold is quite difficult. There is thermal energy everywhere. So scientists must employ several tricks in order to get something to cool down. And in this case, it is to try and stop the antimatter from moving around. Even though the antimatter is captured, it is still moving around within its potential well quite a lot. It is this movement that we refer to as temperature. To remove this temperature, scientists used laser cooling. This technique takes advantage of the Doppler shifting of light and light carrying momentum to remove additional energy from the system. It achieves this by exciting the antihydrogen, which may sound counterintuitive because to excite an atom is to give it more energy, but here we excite in a very specific way. Two lasers are applied to the atom that are almost on resonance with an atomic transition. One is slightly red shifted or has less energy, and one is slightly blue shifted or has more energy. If the atom is moving away from the blue shifted laser, the atom sees the light as having a longer wavelength or less energy. And suddenly, the laser is now on resonance with the atomic transition of the atom and is absorbed, giving the atom a momentum kick. Likewise, if it is moving towards the red shifted laser, the wavelength is Doppler shifted and absorbed. This extra energy is then emitted in a random direction, thus cooling the atom down. In this fashion, the red laser will always add momentum to the atom that opposes its current trajectory, while the blue shifted laser will be aligned with the trajectory. That is, the red shifted laser cools the atom while the blue shifted laser heats it. So now scientists can tune the temperature of the atoms by using both red and blue shifted lasers. Once cold, we can start to look at the fundamental structure of these antimatter atoms. Are there any differences that we haven't already detected? Is there some reason as to why there's so little antimatter left after the Big Bang? Hopefully, we can find out some clues to these questions. Thanks for watching, have fun, see you next time.